Welcome to Supporting Students with Disabilities in Inclusive Classrooms, an online training provided by Deb Leach. This training will provide a rationale for inclusion and cover the following topics, multi-tiered systems of support, positive behavioral interventions and supports, differentiated instruction and universal design for learning, increasing active engagement in the classroom, using evidence-based teaching practices, and collaboration. So let's first discuss the rationale for inclusion, meaning why do we include students with disabilities in general education classrooms? Probably the best way to, to, to ask the question is really to ask why not? Why wouldn't we be including students with disabilities in general education classrooms? Students with disabilities are children, and children um, all have the same rights to access to education and interaction in schools and belonging in communities and schools. And the best way to provide that access is through the inclusion in general education classrooms. I think that many people have the belief system that, um, that self-contained classrooms or se separate settings and resource rooms are places where kids with disabilities go to get quote unquote what they need or to be cured or to get something that they can't get in the general education classroom. And the reality is that those types of separate settings are not curing centers. We are not curing disabilities in segregated settings and we are not necessarily teaching things in those classrooms that couldn't also be taught in the general education classroom while they're learning alongside their typically developing peers engaging in meaningful and enriching academic and social activities. Another truth is that the learning opportunities that occur in general education classrooms cannot be replicated in separate settings. It doesn't matter how fantastic a special education teacher is, it is impossible to recreate what goes on in general education classrooms in a self-contained classroom. You do not have the same access to the same materials, you don't have access to the typically developing peers, and the truth is that special education teachers are not the content experts. The collaboration needed between the content experts and the special education teachers is what's, what is what's key in providing full access to meaningful learning for students with disabilities. And although some people don't recognize this or realize this, the research for the past several decades has shown positive learning and social outcomes for students with and without disabilities who are educated within inclusive classrooms. Of course, this is when inclusive classrooms use the practices and procedures and protocols and such that is included in this training. Simply putting a student in a general education classroom without the necessary supports and services will not guarantee that that student will have positive learning and social outcomes. However, when we do use evidence-based practices and what research shows to be effective in inclusive classrooms, both students with and without disabilities do learn and thrive. In order to effectively deliver supports and services in general education classrooms, it is important for teachers to use the multi-tiered systems of support model. This is a three-tiered system of academic and behavioral support in which at the First tier, or tier one, teachers are using research-based practices to meet the academic and behavioral needs of all students, meaning these are the practices that we know to be effective for all students, regardless of their needs. Regardless of how effective a teacher is in implementing tier one interventions and supports, there will always be students, or there will most likely be students who need additional support beyond what is delivered at the tier one. And that is to be expected. That is not a failure of the teacher or the teaching team when students don't have all their needs met through tier one supports, because the truth is that there are students who do have disabilities or who are at risk or who um, are even advanced. And if you can think of tier two, not just about supporting students who are below grade level or having challenges, but also thinking about what additional supports do you need to put in place for students who are advanced, who are gifted, who need enrichment, because many times those kids are not given the supports they need so that they are challenged and pushed to achieve beyond what is uh, simply done for everyone in the class. 
So at the tier two level, I'll discuss mostly what we do for students with disabilities who are struggling. But at that point, you would look at additional research-based practices for the students who continue to have challenges, either in behavior or a specific academic area. And then you would put those strategies and supports in place and increase the frequency of your progress monitoring, preferably taking data at least once a week on the outcomes that you are hoping to accomplish through your tier two interventions or at a minimum uh, bi-weekly data points. And there will be a small percentage of students that even after tier two interventions and supports are put in place, they are not making the progress that is expected or they are not making any progress. And in that case, we move to more of an individualized look at assessment, meaning we're doing uh, a more thorough analysis to find out why the behavior problems or academic challenges are occurring. And then the interventions that are put in place are much more intense, meaning they might um, have much more variety of different strategies and supports that are used in conjunction with one another and uh, require more of a step-by-step -step process to implement the intervention and more fidelity of intervention as well as it would require more frequent progress monitoring. So that can include daily progress monitoring or at a minimum weekly progress monitoring to determine if the objectives targeted through tier 3 interventions are resulting in the gains that are expected. So before we talk about different strategies and supports and frameworks that should be in place to support students with disabilities in general education classrooms, it's important for teachers to understand the different characteristics that students with disabilities may have, because these are the things that typically will lead to behavioral or academic difficulties. For example, the students might have specific disabilities in, in academic areas. So the student might have a disability in reading, in writing, or math, and that is why the, the child is struggling in those areas. Many students with disabilities have memory challenges, so they require a lot of explicit instruction and um, strategy instruction in order to, re to remember things that for other students that may, be, that may come more naturally. Some students have emotional regulation difficulties, and that involves the inability to um, manage their intense emotions and then process those emotions and cope with those emotions in a way that is considered acceptable in a school setting. So if a student gets frustrated or scared or angry and has emotional regulation difficulties, that can result in um, the student going from 0 to 60 in 0.2 seconds and having an outburst. So if we know that a student has emotional regula regulation difficulties, there are strategies and supports that we could put in place to teach the student how to cope with those things. Other common characteristics include difficulty with attention and focus, uh, difficulty socializing with peers and adults, difficulties with social communication, uh, problems with um, sensory processing, so they may get overstimulated in environments that have an um, avalanche of sensory input, sounds, uh, movement, smells, visual stimuli, um, and for some students that can cause great discomfort and could result in some challenges. There are students who may have medical issues such as allergies, epilepsy, sleep disorders, they may be on medications for attention and focus problems that have other medical side effects. Um, and whenever there are medical issues, it's important for teachers to have constant communication with the family and with um, the associated medical professionals. Some students may have fine and or gross motor deficits, so they'll have difficulty uh, with writing, cutting, um, manipulation of uh, fine motor tasks as well as they could potentially have difficulties with gross motor tasks that could impact their ability to function in recess or physical education and things like that without appropriate um, supports in place. Other students may have motivational issues and they need specialized 
interventions put in place to increase their motivation to engage in tasks that are difficult or not interest-based. There are many students who have heightened levels of anxiety and fear related to social situations, academic situations, um, sensory environments that is important to understand uh, based on the individual's child's profile. Um, many students have difficulty working independently and require supports in order to maintain work without adult support. That also is related to their deficits, their potential deficits in executive functioning. And executive functioning means that students have, um, if they have executive functioning problems, that means they have difficulty with organization, with planning out um, tasks that have multiple steps and components, with time management, and all of those things. So supports would need to be put in place for students who are struggling in that area. It's essential to use positive behavioral interventions and supports in inclusive classrooms. And generally, this is a system of providing preventative strategies and to prevent, to prevent problem behaviors from occurring. And we do this by explicitly teaching expectations and making um, sure students understand what those expectations look like across different school environments. And so this is a proactive approach instead of a reactive approach. So instead of primarily responding to inappropriate behavior by providing punitive consequences, students are taught specific behavioral expectations and um, reinforced for meeting those expectations and redirecting and, and positively redirected when they don't meet those expectations. PBIS is also implemented at um, with three tiers. So PBS falls within multi-tiered systems of support or MTSS, but um, it's important to also consider uh, PBIS as its own entity. And some schools will have a school-wide PBIS implementation and others will not. But if a school is not school-wide PBIS, that certainly doesn't mean that a teacher couldn't or shouldn't use PBIS approaches in an inclusive classroom. So examples of things that teachers could do at a tier one level when implementing PBIS include setting clear expectations for desired behavior, providing explicit instruction to teach those expectations, providing positive feedback to students meeting those expectations, and when doing so, it's important to um, use a ratio of at least six to one positive statements to any negative or corrective statements. When students aren't meeting expectations, it's important to provide positive redirection using a hierarchy of supportive consequences, which I'll talk about in a couple minutes. Um, other examples of Tier 1 positive behavioral interventions and supports include creating a positive climate, uh, so developing positive teacher-student relationships and positive peer-to-peer -peer relationships. Having clearly defined workspaces that make sense to students and they know what is expected in different areas of the room. Using visual supports to help students understand behavioral expectations and to help them be reminded of the behavioral expectations. Having a consistent schedule and structure that the students can trust and depend upon to help them feel comfortable. Keeping students actively engaged during learning activities, which is something that I will talk about a little bit later in this training. Also, that something that will be talked about later in this training is differentiating instruction. So um, that's necessary in an inclusive classroom. We need to differentiate what we teach, how we teach, and how we assess learners to address their readiness levels, their learning profiles, and their interests and uh, cultural and background experiences. Another tier one support would be using a variety of whole group, small group instruction, as well as partner work, group work, and individual work. Students are not able to fully attend and engage during long periods of whole group instruction when they have academic and or behavioral challenges. So having this flexible schedule of variations of instructional formats and independent work formats is essential. I'd like to point out that it is um, 
there is a strategy that's often used, especially in elementary classrooms, that is actually counterproductive for students who have behavioral difficulties. And that's that the color chart or something similar in which all students come to school and they are all on say green meaning they're all good and then as a student engages in problem behavior the teacher has the student walk up and change his or her color um, and this is problematic for a variety of reasons number one it's only focusing on the problem behavior and if you focus on problem behavior you'll get more problem behavior number two it is not the most ethical, humane way to address problem behavior. Having students do the quote unquote walk of shame is really public display of humiliation that's not necessary. And most students who change their color tend to change their color every day, multiple times a day, and may be at red before 9 a.m. and have the rest of the day um, engaging in problem behavior. For the students that the color chart does work for, other more appropriate, positive, ethical, humane behavioral interventions that students with behavioral challenges need would also work for those students. So just because it works for some students, it doesn't mean that that's the only thing that will work for those students. So some alternatives to using a punitive approach with a color chart could be you could use that same color chart, but instead of everybody starting out where they should be and then moving their color if they engage in problem behavior. You can have everybody be on a certain color when they walk in and they're changing their color as they do desirable things. And that could be very unique and differentiated for individual students as far as what you're looking for for them to improve upon and, and show and get reinforced for. Another option is to have a ladder where students move up a ladder at their own pace for demonstrating desirable behaviors. There could be something like a caught you being good chart where students names are displayed and they get stickers or stars um, across you know a chart until they reach the end where they may be reinforced by having another um, tangible or activity reinforcer as they complete their chart. Um, another option is to have ticket systems where students receive tickets for displaying positive behaviors they write their names on the tickets, you collect the tickets, and they're put in a jar, and you can pull from that jar um, to uh, recognize students or to give students special uh, rewards or to have students do special tasks in the classroom or in the school. So having all of those things in place at the Tier 1 level does not guarantee that students will not engage in inappropriate behaviors. So you also have to have a consistent system for responding when kids do not meet expectations. However, we really need to, we need to rethink the word consequences. Most people, when they think of consequences to problem behavior, they're thinking of something punitive that they have to um, do to a child to show the child that he or she did something wrong, to prove a point um, to other students that it was wrong. But it is more productive to shift your thinking of consequences to something that you would do immediately following an undesirable behavior to increase uh, the child's capability to engage in the behaviors that you want. So consequences should be able to redirect the student to engage in desirable behaviors as opposed to send a message that that child did something wrong. And um, a higher, an example of a hierarchy of supported consequences that can be followed is, is, is shown here. So if a child's engaging in an undesirable behavior, the least intrusive thing a teacher may do is simply use proximity control. If that doesn't work, a teacher may choose to use planned ignoring. In behavioral terms, that would really be considered extinction paired with differential reinforcement. What that means is if a child's engaging in an undesirable behavior, the teacher will not attend to that problem behavior. The teacher will look for the student closest to the student engaging in the problem behavior who is engaging in the desirable behavior and provide very specific praise to that peer. Next, the teacher will kind of hover around the student who is having the problem behavior to see if the child corrects the behavior and engages in the desirable behavior that you reinforced the peer for. And finally, if the student does correct his or her behavior, the teacher would deliver positive reinforcement for the, when the student changes the behavior and engages in the desirable behavior. 
all steps of that planned ignoring process have to be followed or it is less likely to have an impact. If that doesn't work, a teacher may use a nonverbal reminder. So that might be some sort of gesture um, showing the number two on your hand if the student needs to follow room number two. It could be a picture, it could be a cue card, um, it could be pointing to the student's work, anything that is um, nonverbal in nature that reminds the student of what the expectation is that should be followed. If that doesn't work, the teacher can use a verbal reminder, which is typically restating the expectation and doing so in a positive, encouraging way. If that doesn't work, a teacher may decide to provide assistance because by that time, if the student hasn't corrected the behavior, it's likely that the student is unable to correct the behavior, meaning they don't, the student doesn't know what to do or the student doesn't understand the academic requirements of a task. Um, so provide assistance could be for behavior or for academics and that you simply, for behavior, you would model the expectation to have the student imitate you. And if it was an academic refusal, then you would help the student with the task at hand and then fade your supports out as soon as the child is able to comply with the request. If that doesn't work, it might mean that the teacher has a private conference with the student to figure out what the problem is in an encouraging, supportive manner and at at that point, figure out what supports the student may need. And if that's unable to be to happen or is, is ineffective, there's two options. A teacher may choose to use timeout or a safe place for de-escalation. Timeout is only a possibility if the student does not want to leave the instructional activity. Most students who have problem behaviors want nothing more than to be asked to leave the instructional activity, so in those cases, timeout cannot work because by definition, Timeout means removal, removal from opportunities for positive reinforcement. So if the child is not receiving positive reinforcement by being with um, maintaining engagement in the activity, taking the child out of the activity would not be considered timeout. In most cases, it's actually considered positive reinforcement because it increases the likelihood that the child would engage in that behavior again to try and um, uh, get into a situation where the teacher would remove the student from that activity. A safe place for de-escalation means that there's a predetermined place in the classroom where the student can go if the student just gets very overwhelmed, emotionally dysregulated and distraught, and the student goes to that place for a short period of time until the child's are able to calm down, and then the child goes back to the task at hand and re-enters re the activities that are going on. Only after you follow a hierarchy of supportive consequences such as this would it be appropriate to consider any other punitive consequences. In truth, if teachers followed the, this hierarchy of supportive consequences or something similar that met the needs of their students, much fewer office discipline referrals would be made, much fewer um, detentions or suspensions or phone calls home or any other punitive consequences would be needed because this type of support often corrects the behavior immediately without needing to use a punitive consequence. Research shows us over and over and over again that punitive consequences do not change behavior. So even though you may think that it is the quote-unquote necessary or right thing to do, if it's not resulting in you getting positive changes in behavior, you're not getting the outcome that you would want anyway. So moving on to Tier 2, Positive Behavioral Interventions and Supports. These are things that would be put in place for students who continue to have behavioral challenges even after all of these Tier 1 examples are in place. And so this means that some students may need um, additional strategies such as um, a, an individualized behavior plan or uh, uh, using self-monitoring or to complete work independently or having a special um, contract for, com or for meeting desirable expectations, um, maybe needing some social narratives to teach them the expectations more explicitly than what the other students need. There's a variety of evidence-based practices that we consider to meet the needs of the students. However, before we choose any additional strategies, we want to do some sort of 
informal functional behavior assessment process at the tier two level. It's not necessary to jump into a full-blown functional behavior assessment or analysis, but there are a series of questions we should ask ourselves when a child is having problem behavior. For example, we want to ask ourselves when, where, and with whom is the behavior most and least likely to occur so that we can figure out why the problem might be happening. We want to find out when it's least likely to occur so we can figure out what promotes positive behavior for that student that maybe we can bring into the environments where the problems are most likely to occur. We also want to find out what typically happens right before the problem behavior, during the occurrence of the problem behavior, and right after the problem behavior to kind of analyze those antecedents and consequences to figure out if those can tell us uh, a reason why the behavior might be occurring. We also want to ask what academic skill deficits the student may have, communication skill deficits, attention focus deficits, social skill deficits, etc. Thinking back to those characteristics of students with disabilities because many times their problem behaviors are occurring because something related to their unique characteristics is not being considered or supported or addressed in a way that helps them thrive in the classroom. We also want to ask to what extent the student engages in positive interactions with peers and with adults. If a student is not having a whole lot of opportunities to have positive interactions with others, then the student is likely engaging in problem behavior to get any interaction with others, which is often negative interaction at that point. And Typically, it is a one-to-one -one correspondence with problem behavior. So a student will engage in problem behavior and always get attention from a teacher or a peer. Albeit negative, it doesn't matter. It is attention. And when a student has no attention, that is a basic human need. It is not a problem behavior for that a student wants attention. That's a basic human need. And if you think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, the first level is, you know, safety and getting your basic needs met. And the next level is sense of belonging and love and connection with other people. So the, if a student has behavior problems and you recognize that the student does not really have a sense of belonging with peers in their classroom and in their school, then a part of your intervention plan has to be about supporting and facilitating positive relationships with peers. The most important question to ask when a child's having behavioral challenges is to actually ask the student why he or she is engaging in the behavior. Now, if you ask it in a way that makes a child nervous, the child likely will not answer you. Or if the child is nonverbal or has minimal verbal skills, the child will not be able to answer you. But in some cases, a student will tell you exactly why the problem behavior is occurring without you having to spend a whole lot of time trying to figure that out on your own. And too often we skip the, the step of asking the student why the problem behavior is occurring. So once you ask all those questions, you would develop some sort of hypothesis as to why the problem behavior is occurring. Classically and typically, People are identifying that a behavior problem is happening because the child's trying to avoid or escape from something or the child's trying to get something. Well, that is only a, a drop in the bucket because what's more important is why is the child trying to get whatever that is? Or why is a child trying to avoid or escape from whatever that is? If we don't know why that's happening, then our interventions are not going to address the need. Um, and it's also important to note that the reason why a child is having these behavior problems cannot be described as because a student is lazy, defiant, manipulative, spoiled. Um, those are de um, just mean terms and it's name calling, but that is not productive. If a student appears to be lazy, um, a better way to frame that is the student has difficulty with motivation when presented with tasks that are difficult or not interest-based. Because if we find out that that's the case, we could put supports in place to help the student um, cope with difficult material. And there are practices we can put in place to use more interest-based approaches to motivating students to engage in learning activities. Finally, when you're making and you're trying to figure out what the hypothesis for this problem behavior is, it's important to 
understand that the child's unique characteristics are often related to the root of the problem behaviors. And so that is why it's super important for any child who's receiving um, special services to um, have a, a learning profile and a characteristics profile that the teachers understand. Okay, so when it comes time to develop tier two behavioral interventions, there are three things that teachers can attempt to, attempt to change or modify. The most important thing to look at first are any changes or modifications needed within the environment or different environments. Um, so that could be things that are sensor related that are causing the problems, if the classroom is kind of chaotic, which is causing problems, is it the seating arrangements, is it the visual stimuli, are there not enough visual supports, is the structure not um, consistent, um, does the child need a, a visual schedule, those are examples of uh, modifications to the environment. You can also make changes or modifications to the behavior of the adults and peers in the child's environment. So many times, adult or peer behavior could be maintaining the problem behavior. So for example, if a peer is um, shouting out and every time the child shouts out, the teacher calls on the student or accepts the response, that could reinforce the shouting out behavior. If a teacher is yelling at a child, Every time the child engages in a problem behavior, the actual act of yelling at the child could be what's maintaining the problem behavior. Um, so we need to look at those consequences following the behavior that adults and peers are, are delivering to see if there is a pattern and if those consequences are increasing the likelihood that the problem behavior is occurring, we have to alter the behavior of peers and adults. Um, it also includes increasing um, the frequency of positive reinforcement del delivered by adults and peers in the classroom. A lot of kids with behavioral challenges don't have the frequency of positive reinforcement and specific praise that they need to maintain the presentation of desirable behaviors. And third is um, you can consider any new skills or replacement behaviors that you would need to explicitly teach the child so the child does not have to engage in the problem behavior. Just keep in mind that this is the, there are three things to consider. Most um, people would just consider what do we have to change about the child. While there, is th there are skills we could teach the child, it is equally important, if not more important, to think about what changes we have to make within the environment or changes to adult or peer behavior. Because all behavior is an interaction between the person and the environment in which they are in. Another way to consider how you're going to address problem behaviors is to consider the three I's that Rob Horner talked about. And these include uh, making the problem behavior irrelevant. So if there's something that you can change about the environment or about the behavior of peers and adults that would no longer require the problem behavior to be exhibited, that's making it irrelevant. So if a child has the problem behavior um, 30 minutes before lunch every day because the child is starving, you can institute a snack time, say an hour before lunch to prevent the need for the problem behavior because the child is hungry. Or if the child has difficulty with behavior in math because it comes right after recess and math is very difficult, um, it may make that problem behavior irrelevant by making math so something that occurs earlier in the day where the child is more fresh and able to handle more difficult tasks. You can make a problem behavior ineffective by making sure that it no longer works. So if a child cries and the teacher comes over and provides assistance to the child, then that's making the crying work for the student. So you would to make something ineffective, you would have to stop delivering that consequence that was maintaining it. However, you then would need to teach the child a the more desirable behavior and then make sure that you reinforce that and so the child wouldn't need to display the behavior that's a problem and that leads to uh, making sure uh, problem behavior is inefficient. So crying is would, it, we would be much more inefficient than raising hand and asking for help. So you can get help much quicker if you just raise your hand 
and ask for help without first having to go through a, a, a buildup of crying and being louder and louder and louder until eventually a teacher comes over and helps. And finally, another model to consider when you're planning behavioral interventions is the prevent, teach, reinforce model. And um, so that focuses primarily on antecedent intervention. So what can we do to prevent problem behaviors from occurring in the first place? And um, if you're familiar with behavior intervention plans, too many of them are focused solely on consequence interventions, meaning what reinforcement systems do you have in place to um, recognize students when they engage in the desirable behavior. But most kids who have problem behaviors are not engaging in desirable behavior frequently enough or at the um, level that we want in order to be reinforced. So we have to put antecedent interventions in place to increase the likelihood that the students will be able to engage in the behaviors we want so that we can then reinforce them. So examples of antecedent interventions might be things like altering a schedule, um, providing more choices, um, having the student work with a partner instead of independently. You know, the list could be a mile long, but it, you don't know what the antecedent intervention would be until you know the function of the problem behavior. The next step in prevent, teach, reinforce is to teach, and that is when you're providing explicit instruction of a replacement behavior or new skill that the student needs to demonstrate so that the problem behavior is no longer necessary. And then the last step is reinforce, and that's where you use consequence intervention. So you reinforce the student for meeting the expectations. And it also would include error correction. So if a student does not engage in the behaviors you want, that's when you would redirect the student to engage in the behaviors you want and then reinforce once the student complies. Okay, the next important component of inclusive classrooms is the use of differentiated instruction. And this is an approach to teaching students who are diverse that meets the unique learners, the meet unique needs of every learner in the classroom. And so this is an approach that benefits all kids because you're focusing on providing a variety of instructional methods and supports. So here's the model for differentiated instruction that um, Tomlinson presented back in 1999. And I will say that Teachers do not have to dif differentiate every single thing for every single reason that I'm discussing here, but you're always thinking about how you can improve your differentiation to meet the different needs of the students in your classes. So here's the options for differentiated instruction. You can differentiate content, process, or product to address readiness levels, interests, and learning profiles. So what does that mean? You can differentiate what you teach, you could differentiate how you teach or how students are learning because students aren't always learning by explicit instruction. They could be learning through activities that are facilitated and, and nurtured. Um, and you could differentiate how you assess student learning. And the purpose of making any of those differentiated decisions is to address students' readiness levels, meaning where they're performing in reading, writing, math, etc to address their interests and their cultural experiences. So what is it that you can change about what you're teaching or how you're teaching or how you're assessing that can help the student engage related because it's related to something they're interested in or something that they've experienced in their lives. And also to address their learning profile. So how does this student learn best? And then you take that information and you decide how you're gonna differentiate the process of the student's learning or the, the way that they're being assessed to address their learning profile. Universal design for learning is very similar to differentiated instruction. It's just different language and um, the main difference is that in differentiated instruction we do consider differentiating what we're teaching because there might be students with very severe disabilities in an inclusive classroom that it's not just about making accommodations and putting um, differentiated process and product in place. It's also about considering what the um, objectives of the lesson may need to be adapted to or modified to for the student to be able to engage and learn. Um, so with Universal Design for Learning, there are three things that teachers would focus on. They would focus on providing multiple means of engagement, meaning how are you going to stimulate students and motivate them to engage in the learning activities. And you would typically do that by tapping into their interests. 
um, and their learning profiles. The other thing teachers would do would be to provide multiple means of representation. So you're delivering instruction in a variety of different ways so that students have different avenues for accessing the information related to what how they learn best. And finally, teachers would provide multiple means of action and expression. So that's different ways that the students can demonstrate what they know. So there's not just a multiple choice test or just an essay uh, exam or things like that. There's a variety of ways that students can show what they know um, as opposed to relying on one type of assessment for all students. The next essential component of inclusive classrooms is having active engagement in the classroom. So um, there are a variety of different ways that you can increase active engagement and here are just some examples. Spending a lot of time accessing children's background knowledge can increase their uh, purpose for participating in lessons. And if they don't have that background knowledge, spend some time actually building a background knowledge that's necessary for academic, academic engagement. And we can often do that by showing students video clips and pictures and things if they haven't had experiences in something that would be related to the learning. Teaching at the concrete level first, so using concrete representational abstract, not just in math but in other areas to help students learn concepts and then be able to move to more abstract levels of thinking. Ensuring success and independence. If the, if the tasks are too difficult, the students are not going to be motivated to engage. But if the tasks are developmentally appropriate and the student is set up for success and they can work independently, that's going to be very reinforcing and the student's going to be more likely to be engaged. Providing real life examples that they've experienced that could connect them to the activities that are going on or the lessons being presented. Having more choices uh, and that can include choices of materials, choices of activities, choices of who they work with, choices of what they're learning, what are their topics, and those kinds of things. Tapping into students' strengths and interests as much as possible. Increasing their opportunities to respond during group lessons. So you can do that by having response cards, using gestures for students to respond, having core responding, and increased questioning. So in, in essence, all of these things mean that students with disabilities or other challenges are not passive learners. So they're not just going to sit and get information. There are a bunch of different things that teachers can do, though, to keep them engaged throughout the lesson. And, and so some, some other examples are having more partner activities as opposed to just having the students sit and listen to the teacher or just sit and work independently. Providing guided notes during lecture-based and activities and other types of group instruction. Um, having students draw as they engage in instruction to um, demonstrate what they're getting from the lesson. Um, you can also have them do that as an assessment activity, but it's really helpful for them to do that to maintain engagement during a lesson. Using role play activities, having movement. Um, providing something for the student to do related to the lesson while instruction is being provided. So that could be guided notes, but it could be something else. So for students who can multitask, the teacher might be teaching a lesson while the student is flipping through a book that has pictures related to what the teacher is talking about. Using behavioral momentum is a strategy that um, to keep students engaged and motivated, you use a repeated pattern of easy, easy, difficult, easy, easy, difficult, easy, easy, difficult, and you can continue that pattern as opposed to having the student do one difficult thing after the next and then eventually the student shuts down. Using more project-based learning and authentic learning experiences can help kids um, stay more meaningfully engaged, having more use of manipulatives and hands-on learning activities, and as much as possible integrating the arts, so music, uh, movement, drawing, drama, those kinds of things usually stimulate the active engagement of students who have trouble um, with behavior or academic issues. Okay, so you can have all of those things in place. You have your positive behavior interventions and supports, your differentiated instruction, you have lots of active engagement, and there are still going to be students who struggle. And so it's important for teachers to always know that there are numerous evidence-based teaching practices that are available for teachers to use when students are still having problems. And this is something that will always be changing as we do more research with uh, students and 
to find out what helps students address specific academic or behavioral targets. But probably the most evidence-based instructional practice when it comes to teaching skills is the use of explicit instruction. This has been um, an evidence-based practice since early in the 1980s at a minimum. And so a lot of teachers think that they're following an explicit instruction model, but they're usually leaving out some essential components of it. So an explicit instruction model has lesson introduction, lesson presentation, guided practice, independent practice, closure, and then plans for maintenance and generalization. And I will go into all of those different steps in the next slides. But within all of that, also part of explicit instruction is having increased opportunities for successful responses throughout the lesson, um, effective use of specific academic praise, using clear, concise, and consistent language, and delivering lessons at a brisk pace. Those are other essential elements, but now I'll go into the different steps of explicit instruction lessons. So explicit instruction is used when you're teaching a new skill, and most students would benefit from this type of lesson. I would tell you, though, there are a few students who wouldn't need this level of, ex of explicit instruction. So students who can just um, have you tell them what they're going to learn, you show them one example, and then they're ready to go off and do it, they wouldn't need explicit instruction, and they don't have to sit through an explicit instruction lesson. You can do that and then provide the explicit instruction for the rest of the students who would require it, which is probably the majority of the students in most classrooms not just students with disabilities. So at the beginning of the lesson, you would state the behavioral expectations and then move into the lesson, which you would start by accessing or building their background knowledge, reviewing any prerequisite skills that are ne needed to go to this lesson. So that should be very brief because they should already know the skills. And then you would state the learning objectives that you're going to address um, during the lesson. Now, it's important to know where your students are performing related to the skills that you're about to teach, um, or you would it wouldn't be a matter of just reviewing prerequisite skills if the student doesn't have those skills. So um, knowing where your students are performing academically will only um, enhance the way that you set objectives and plan lessons when you're using explicit instruction. The second step of explicit instruction is the actual lesson presentation, and it could be referred to as modeling or the phrase, I do it. And this is usually pretty brief, depending on the skill. It shouldn't be any more than five to 10 minutes. And this is when you are demonstrating how to perform the specific skill or task, and you're doing many examples so that the students eventually will be ready to demonstrate that skill or task with you in the next phase. So it's not just one example and then an assignment. So many different examples until the students start to catch on. But while you're doing this at this phase of the lesson, you should still be having lots of active engagement to keep the students with you while you're modeling. So you can ask a lot of questions to, um, that address their previously learned skills. Um, you can have them imitate what you're demonstrating while you're demonstrating it. Um, you're not asking them to be able to do this um, new skill yet, you're just involving them with you while you're doing it. After several examples and you start to get the feeling that the students are ready to participate is when you would move to the next phase which is guided practice or you can use the phrase we do it. And in this phase teachers will gradually fade out what they're doing and increase the student's participation in completing that skill or task. So it's not just, okay, I did it, now here's one for you to do. The guided practice means, okay, let's do one together now, and you're using um, scaffolding, graduated guidance, or most to least prompting, which all generally mean the same thing. And what that means is, so the first example when we're doing guided practice, the teacher is doing most of it and the students are doing just a little bit of it. And then they do another example and the students do a little bit more and then the teacher fades out until eventually the students are doing the whole thing and the teacher's there just to give feedback. So in guided practice, it's essential that immediate feedback is given to students as they do each next each example that comes. So they're positively reinforced if they're uh, completing the task correctly or you're using error correction procedures immediately so they do not learn the wrong way to do something. Um, another way to think about uh, scaffolding in, in most of these prompting is to you can move from 
um, you're you're telling students what to do. You know, you're you're first showing students what to do, then you're telling students what to do, and then you're reminding students what to do is another way to think about how you're going to fade out your support during this phase. Um, you'll continue in guided practice with as many examples that are needed until the students are ready to work independently without needing prompts and support to complete the task. Keep in mind that not all students will be ready for independent practice at the same time, so you will have to plan for differentiation, meaning a lot you want to, approximately 80% of your class may be ready for independent practice and they can move to that phase, and then the other students who still need more guided practice would have the option to continue in a small group with the teacher to have more guided practice until they're ready for independent practice. During independent practice, the students have an opportunity to perform the task or skill without any prompting from the teacher, but they're still receiving immediate feedback. So they will get positive reinforcement if they complete the task correctly and error correction if they, if they have any uh, problems with, with completing the task. Um, if a student is making many errors and needs lots of error correction, it's probably an indication that the student needs more guided practice. Another thing to keep in mind here is that with explicit instruction, the I do it, the we do it, and the independent practice, which is you do it, all should look exactly the same. So the task doesn't change. It is. It looks exactly the same. You're just moving from the teacher doing it to the teacher doing it with the students and to the students doing it by themselves. If you want to move the students to doing more application-based activities related to the skill, that would be your, your, um, your focus on generalization, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. But when they're first learning a new skill, you should not be moving to more complicated assignments and activities if your focus was on teaching a specific skill in a certain format. At the end of the lesson, you would summarize what was learned in the lesson and involving students in that wrap up and let the students know what's going to come next. You know, how are they going to have opportunities to practice the skill and or apply the skills in different contexts. So anytime you're using explicit instruction, there's no purpose in learning a skill if the student isn't going to be able to maintain that skill and generalize that skill. Um, students go through four stages of learning when they're learning something new. The first stage is skill acquisition and so you're going to use this explicit instruction model that I just described to teach a skill that the student doesn't know. That's called skill acquisition. This child is just learning it for the first time. The next phase stage of learning is fluency and that means the student has learned the skill but now the child needs to learn to do that you know with ease without error and quickly and so that would be kind of practice activities and repetition activities that would happen after an explicit instruction lesson takes place over the course of time. Maintenance means the student has already demonstrated fluency and can maintain the fluency of that skill over time, meaning the child doesn't lose that skill. And then generalization means not only can the child maintain that skill, but the child can use that skill in different contexts and in some cases may develop new skills because of the skill that was learned. What's important to know about students with disabilities is they often don't go through these four stages of learning without the facilitation of teachers to make that happen. So a lot of typically developing kids, you would teach them at skill acquisition and then they naturally go through fluency, maintenance, and generalization without a lot of careful planning by teachers. But kids with disabilities often need teachers to specifically target maintenance and generalization and fluency for that learning to take place. And that's the reason why a lot of kids lose skills is because teachers only teach at that skill acquisition level. Okay, so explicit instruction is the is a very um, high quality evidence based practice that all teachers in inclusive classrooms should and should use. But there are tons of other evidence-based teaching practices to address behavior, reading skills, writing skills, math skills. And so um, this training would be, you know, three days long if I went into all of these different evidence-based practices. But I just want to point out examples of evidence-based practices when kids aren't, aren't meeting um, expectations 
just to give you an idea that there's always something more you can think about putting in place. So using more visual supports could be a practice you use. Um, using prompting fading procedures, using task analysis and chaining, using self-management and self-monitoring, using CRA or concrete representationalized abstract to help students learn math concepts. For reading comprehension, you might use uh, reciprocal teaching, um, using more positive reinforcement to help students with math problem solving, you can use schema-based instruction. To help students with written expression, you can use self-regulated strategy development. To help students who are at the Tier 3 level in behavior, you may be using a check-in, check-out system. You might be using social narratives or video modeling or peer-mediated intervention instruction or shaping to help with students learning other behavioral expectations. To help students with motivational problems, you can use uh, behavioral momentum, or it's also called high probability instructional sequences. To include, improve reading fluency, you might use repeated readings or partner reading or reader's theater. To increase the learning of different academic skills, you might use PALS, which is peer assistant learning strategies. For improving math fact fluency or spelling skills, you can use cover, copy, compare to help students, another strategy for helping students with math facts is to use the taped problems intervention. So again, these are just examples that I want to share uh, with you so that you know that there are things out there that you can find more information about to address student needs. Now the final component of quality inclusive classrooms is to have ongoing collaboration among the teachers in the classroom, the families of the students, the other professionals that may be working uh, to support the student and any paraprofessionals involved in supporting the students in the classroom. Um, before I go into the details of these things, I do want to point out that there is a misuse of paraprofessionals in inclusive classrooms, meaning many times that's the only support that's provided. A student is put in a general education classroom and the support that's provided is a one-on-one -on -one or a para or an aide or something like that. Um, there is no evidence in the re research that supports the use of one-on-ones for students with disabilities in inclusive classrooms. That is not to say that we that teachers don't need more support in the classroom. A paraprofessional can be very helpful in an inclusive classroom. However, that paraprofessional should be working to support the needs of all the students in the classroom, not assigned as a one-on-one -on -one to a student. And that paraprofessional must be working under the supervision of the general education teacher and the special education teacher to be able to fulfill expectations and roles and responsibilities that are gonna help students learn. Um, there are a lot of negative consequences when you have paraprofessionals serving as one-on-ones. For example, the students become very prompt dependent and reliant on those paraprofessionals. They often um, are barriers to social interaction with their peers. Um, they might distract learning in the classroom because they aren't really given a whole lot of guidance and they're just kind of serving as um, uh, like almost police officers to keep students engaged. Um, but the truth is that paraprofessionals, if they were used appropriately, they can actually promote socialization for, of students and their peers in the classroom if they're working under the guidance of a special education teacher and general education teacher and not just thrown into the classroom to solve the problems that might occur. Um, and families are the experts on their kids. So the more that, that teachers can communicate with families and involve them in problem solving and getting ideas, the better. As opposed to looking at the family's role is to just do what you ask them to do at home to help you meet the objectives in the classroom. We really need to switch that around to how can families help us as educators put supports in place that are going to help their child thrive. Additionally, we can support families and how we can support them in meeting their students' needs at home. So it's not just about working with families to get homework done or to learn skills that are being targeted in the classroom. 
As far as collaboration among professionals, the basic there would be the collaboration between a general education teacher and a special education teacher. And the best way for that collaboration to occur, although not always feasible, is through the use of co-teaching. And so I'll spend a few minutes talking about the different co-teaching models that can be used. But even if co-teaching is not in place, there must be ongoing collaboration between the special education teacher and the general education teacher to support the needs of that student in the classroom. Other professionals that could and should be a part of that uh, collaboration if they are working with the student include the speech language pathologist, an occupational therapist, a physical therapist, a behavior support person, any medical professionals, um, guidance counselors, mental health workers, anybody that is interacting with that child and supporting that, style, that child should all be collaborating to make sure that the needs of this child met, are being met across the board. So I'll spend a few minutes talking about co-teaching because if you are in a situation where a general education teacher and special education teacher are co-teaching in a classroom, that can go really well or it could be underutilized. Just as a paraprofessional could be underutilized in a classroom, so can a special education teacher. Also want to point out that there are some paraprofessionals that can serve in some of these co-teaching roles because there are some paraprofessionals who actually have degrees in education or are very um, have a lot of experience in working with kids and actually want more responsibilities with teaching. So you can certainly use these co-teaching models with paraprofessionals. The only difference is that when you're co-teaching um, with a special education and general education teacher, those two teachers are sharing responsibilities for planning. If you're co-teaching with a paraprofessional, the certified teacher should be the ones planning the lessons and training the paraprofessionals on how to deliver the lessons, but then a paraprofessional can certainly deliver a small group lesson or facilitate um, a whole group lesson alongside a general education teacher or a special education teacher. Finally, you can use these co-teaching models with related service providers. So if a speech language pathologist is coming into the classroom instead of doing pull-out, say during a language arts block, you can use different co-teaching models to enhance the instruction of all the students in the classroom and also provide opportunities for the speech language pathologist to service the students on his or her caseload. So overall, co-teaching is two or more teachers sharing planning, instruction, and assessment responsibilities for the entire group of students. And the purpose of doing so is to have a greater impact on student learning than what would be possible through solo teaching or teaching with just one teacher in the room. There are different models of co-teaching. I would say that um, the most difficult model to use would be teaming. And with teaming or team teaching, that means that both teachers are teaching whole, the whole group at, at one time. And that requires an extensive amount of planning to be able to make that uh, fluent and that both teachers are being utilized to their full potential as opposed to a special education teacher just assisting a gen ed teacher with a, list, a lesson that is not teaming. So you ha the only time that you really would need to use teaming is if there was a need for two teachers to teach a lesson. So you just have to ask yourself that question. Would it be better to teach this lesson with two people and for what purpose? And then you would define those responsibilities accordingly. I will say that if you're using explicit instruction for a large group of students as opposed to a small group of students, teaming is very helpful because in order to provide that immediate feedback during guided and independent practice, you would need more than one person to do so. Another uh, model of co-teaching that's very effective is station teaching, and that's when you would have one teacher teaching a lesson at a station, another teacher teaching a lesson at another station, and you can have another station that's more like a center, that's an independent activity or a group activity for students without a teacher delivering a lesson. So station teaching is different from centers because when they're with a the teacher, there's actually a lesson going on. And there's different options. The students can rotate through the different stations, or it might be that they don't go to all of the different stations. Parallel teaching is when you would simply split your group in half and each teacher would teach the same thing but to a smaller group of students or they may teach the same thing but use different approaches to meet the different learning profiles of the students in the classroom. 
Alternative teaching is when there's one teacher that's primarily responsible for teaching all the students in the class a specific lesson, and the other teacher is doing something else with a student or small group of students. So that might be um, maybe using priming to get students ready for an upcoming lesson. So to prepare them, you're pre-teaching some things. It could be, uh, of course, it could be uh, remediation or review, but you don't want to do a whole lot of that if the students then are missing the instruction that's taking place that's going to put them further behind. You can also use alternative teaching for enrichment. So for the kids who are the high performers in the class, you can often pull those kids aside for a very short period of time and give them some enrichment and guidance and facilitation that they can then go ahead and then move to their independent work or group work without needing teacher support 100% um, of the time. The other models are one teach, one assist, which is the most used model, which is the most ineffective model because that means that you have one teacher teaching and another teacher just kind of walking around and helping. While there is some benefit to that as far as promoting positive behaviors and addressing student questions, it often looks like the special education teacher is serving as a paraprofessional or a teacher assistant and the gen ed teacher is actually teaching the content. Um, station teaching and parallel teaching would are often much more effective in actually promoting student learning than one teach, one assist. And one teach, one observe would only be used if there was data that needed to be collected. So say um, a functional behavior assessment was being done, one teacher might be assisting and the other teacher might be collecting behavioral data. Or if you were doing a, an assessment that required oral responses, one teacher might be administering that and facilitating that while another teacher is documenting student responses. The benefits of using a variety of these different co-teaching models are to increase active student engagement, to effectively utilize all the teachers in the classroom, to increase opportunities for differentiated instruction to address the needs of all the learners. If you're not differentiating your instruction and you have co-teachers in the room, you're wasting the supports that you have. The, the whole purpose of having two teachers in the room is to help you differentiate that instruction. Another really important component of using co-teaching is to provide opportunities to embed instruction related to IEP goals within meaningful instructional activities. So oftentimes, students' IEP goals are only addressed if they're outside of a general education classroom. So if they go to resource or if they're part of the day in a, in a, in a self-contained classroom or all the day in a self-contained classroom, their IEP goals are getting addressed. And then people view when they're in the general education classroom, that's when they're working on you know, general education standards and curriculum. But often, the best way to address IEP goals is actually by addressing them within the context of general education instruction. So they might have communication goals or social goals or behavioral goals or reading fluency goals or writing goals that could be all implemented, say, within different science lessons. And ultimately, the benefit of using these different co-teaching models is to improve student learning outcomes. So when teachers are co-teaching, they, this is what the classroom should look like. An outside observer should not be able to tell who the general education teacher and who the special education teacher is. They also shouldn't be able to distinguish between the general education students and students with disabilities. Um, the students should view both teachers as their teachers. The teachers should view all the students as their students. It should be evident that both teachers had responsibility for planning instruction, delivering instruction, and assessing student learning and both teachers should be utilized as teachers at all times. And if you compare an effective co-taught classroom to solo teaching or a classroom where there's only one teacher, you should see more active engagement, more differentiated instruction, fewer behavior problems, and more peer interactions during instructional activities. It could be very difficult to plan for the using of, of co-teaching models, so here are a couple of things for you to consider. The, the most important thing for you to do is to have relevant student info to inform your differentiated instruction decisions, meaning you have to know what skills the students have already mastered and what they have not mastered. You need to know um, what accommodations and supports they need related to their unique characteristics. Um, and then when you get to the point of planning lessons, you can use these essential questions to, to guide your planning. 
So you would first want to know, what do you want the students to learn? In what ways will they learn it? What are different ways to determine if they met the learning objectives? What will you do for students who don't master the learning objectives? And what will you do for students who already mastered the learning objectives while the majority of the students have not? And you also want to ask, are both or all the teachers being utilized effectively? Um, and what, what is really beneficial is if you can make co-teaching frameworks a regular instructional routine when they work well. So for example, in a language arts classroom, you might use station teaching, where one teacher is working on expository writing, and another teacher is working on uh, grammar skills. And maybe you have a center where they're working on reading comprehension activities. And once you get a framework like that working, all you have to do is alter your lessons of the day, but the framework is already there and it takes a lot less time for planning to occur. Okay, so in summary, for effective, inclusive classrooms, teachers should be um, understanding the unique characteristics of their students. They should be using positive behavioral interventions and supports, utilizing differentiated instruction and or universal design for learning to address the unique needs of the learners in the classroom, promoting active engagement throughout the day during all learning activities, and collaborating with families, professionals, and paraprofessionals in ways that improve student learning. For additional information about these topics, I would recommend um, going to the following websites. www.swiftschools.org is a National Inclusion Technical Assistance Center. They provide um, videos and they have manuals for promoting more inclusive environments in schools. Um, PaulaKluth.com is a website um, designed by Paula Kluth that has great ideas for teachers in regard to differentiated instruction and the inclusion for students with autism spectrum disorders, but it's also really helpful for the inclusion of all kids with disabilities. BringingABA.com is actually my website and that focuses on using ABA teaching pr practices in inclusive classrooms and it includes different readings for teachers to um, gather information about as well as um, a variety of different lesson plans to address specific skills in inclusive classrooms. And the UDLcenter.org provides more information about universal design for learning. If you have any questions related to the content in this training, please feel free to email me at leachd at winthrop.edu. That's L-E-A-C-H-D at W-I-N-T-H-R-O-P dot E-D-U. Thank you.